uh, he's a big fan of whiskey. So if you guys have got something and want to give him uh, or impress him, get him drunk with whiskey. Which I'm aware of that. And yes, this second edition, second car, uh, which is on screen. So yes, he's a big car fan as well. Uh, yeah, over to you, Paris. Okay. It helps to turn things on. We learned something about electronics already. Um, okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, just a show of hands. Um, who here enjoys security? Okay. And who here enjoys reverse engineering? All right, now, oh, well, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Now, lower your hand if you kind of only do security as an excuse to do reverse engineering. <laughs> um, this lecture today is about reverse engineering and how much fun it is, and security is really not a part of this lecture. Um, I really, I mean, I, I will do security when I'm paid for it, I will do security when it's interesting, um, but the real reason why I care about this stuff is because I really like taking stuff apart. And when you take stuff apart, you get to see how it works from the inside. And um, that's the sort of stuff that I would do for free, uh, and that I do do for free. Um, if you find yourself writing C++ after work in order to calm down, maybe that's a good profession for you. Um, so I'd like to begin by telling all of you at this conference, when you meet a stranger, uh, to ask this question, like, what are you tinkering with? Because uh, if you ask, what do you do, some people will um, name their employer or... Um, begin explaining their startup or something, when all you really want to know is like a really cool trick for, um, I don't know, like recognizing pointers when you reverse engineering code. Uh, for example, in a 32-bit operating system, if the most significant bit of the pointer is a 1, it belongs to the kernel. If it's a 0, it belongs to user app. In um, Thumb2 firmware, if the least significant bit of the pointer is a 0, it is probably data. And if the least significant bit of the pointer is a 1, it is probably code, because in ARM, the least significant bit of the program counter indicates the execution mode. And there are, there are lots of little tricks like that that you can share in conversation as soon as you confirm that you have a shared dialect with the other person. Um, I, I can't explain these pointer tricks at my neighborhood bar. No one will understand them, and I'll be wasting my time, which is why I come to things like this, because here I can have a deep conversation about wherever my interests overlap. Um, so for my end, uh, lately I've been tinkering with this car and a few others. Uh, this is a Studebaker. Um, if you watch TV shows from the 1980s, there's always a punchline about a Studebaker. And the guy will say, oh man, uh, I'd, I'd love for you to give me a ride home from the bar, but I really can't have my neighbors see me arrive in a Studebaker. Um, but I, I love these things because they're old and they're cheap. They're easy to buy and they're easy to work on and they're beautiful. Look at this thing. Um, I could pay 10, 20 times as much just to get something that looked like every other car on the road. Um, I've also been playing around with um, my buddy Justin Osborne on uh, simgrate.com which is an API server. It's not a startup. It's just an API that you can call. We don't authenticate. We don't even know how many users we have. Um, basically, you give me the first 18 bytes of the thumb2 function, and I give you its name if it exists in any publicly available ARM SDK from the past 15 years. Um, this is produced by having a collection of all of these SDKs. Uh, embedded compilers... Um, I, I don't mean to scare any young children in the room, but we used to have to pay for compilers, and in the embedded systems world, we still do. So uh, 
if you don't know how to write your own linking script and you were to instead use a commercial compiler, um, you can purchase one, but it, they're available by shareware. So you download it from the website, you run it for 30 days or with a restriction on the linking size. And this linking size restriction is cool because it means that the free version of the compiler includes every library from the full version of the compiler. So we were able to build a fingerprinting database of all of the libraries from all of the commercial C compilers without having to license them. Uh, if anyone from IAR is in the license is in the room, please don't sue the shit out of me for this. Um, the end result of this API, we also have like client libraries for Ida Pro, Ghidra, Binary Ninja. So when you're working on a project and you don't know what your function names are, you can just upload the beginning of every function to us, and then we give you back the symbol name. Um, we do not log the queries, but we have every ability to. So like, don't do this for any secret agent shit. Um, we've been joking about doing a professional version on DVD. <laughs> um, I've also been working on a, a book of microcontroller exploits. So, uh, if you want to reverse engineer a device, and that device is locked and will not allow you to read the firmware out, and uh, it has a particular chip on it, um, you basically look in the index of this book, you jump to that page, and then it tells you how to exploit that board. Uh, the appendices cover more than a hundred different published... Um, academic and blog post articles, and then every full chapter is an exploit reverse engineered from scratch. Um, one recent one that I've published early is Reviews Cards. This is the, um, uh, the Dish Network uh, card by Nagravision. Um, David Mordensen, who I was really hoping would attend this conference, um, he wrote a secret paper in 1998 on how to exploit these. Um, while working for NDS, and then during the NDS Nagra lawsuit, his secret internal report was revealed through Discovery, so now you can download and read it, and it is a beautiful report. It shows how they began by sticking needles into the chip in order to stun the um, instruction fetch latch, so that the CPU kept thinking it was fetching the same instruction, and that turns the program counter into a linear counter. And then the, um, the program counter just keeps counting upward to the next byte, and the CPU keeps getting the same byte, but the real byte goes over the data bus. So as you're ticking through this, you have a needle on one of the data bits, and then you get like all of the least significant bit for all of memory in order. And then you move the needle one over, and then you get all of uh, bit one, and bit two, and bit three, and bit four, and bit five, and bit six, and bit seven, and then you line them up, and then you have the complete firmware image. And the best part is that all of this access comes as code fetches, not as data fetches. So it never triggers the memory firewall that's intended to prevent you from reading out the, uh, the firmware. Now, of course, this is really labor intensive. You need a lab, you need all of this other stuff. So the second half of this report shows how there's a buffer overflow vulnerability. The incoming buffer, uh, a smart card packet has a one byte length, so it can get to 255 bytes. Um, the incoming buffer is at the tail end of RAM, and RAM wraps around. So after the end of RAM, you have 32 bytes that are just nothing. Nothing is mapped there. If you write to them, nothing happens. If you read back, it reads a zero. But after that, you have another copy of RAM. So by writing a long packet, even though like nothing shows up in the memory map in the data sheet, there's actually RAM there, and you can then overwrite it smash the return pointer on the call stack, and then um, having control of the return pointer, you then have native code execution in SRAM. So I took this report, and I took um, a modern smart card reader, and USB smart card readers are very different from the serial port ones, because um, USB likes to have layers of abstraction. Uh, it, you cannot receive an illegally long packet on a USB reader. You cannot receive a packet with a bad checksum. There are all of these rules. So I wrote fresh shell code that is now compatible with the modern smart card reader, along with a Golang client, so you can grab this Go application, build it on your Linux or Windows machine, and in any USB smart card reader, you can dump a copy of all of the firmware from this device, or run arbitrary shell code just providing it as a string on the command. Um, about a year ago, I got really bummed out that I used to do invasive hardware attacks on microchips. 
that I used to boil them in acids and photograph them. And so my buddy John McMaster here, he nerd sniped me into building a full home chemistry lab. Um, I can now do decapping, I can do delayering, I can do etching of implant ROMs, which allows me to, um, to see the difference between P-silicon and N-silicon. Um, and then I got uh, recursively nerd sniped into writing this tool. Uh, it's called MaskROM tool. This is an application in Qt6 and C++ that allows you to mark rows and columns of, um, of the ROM. And then uh, each little square that's, a red, that's red or blue, um, these are the bits. The blue ones are zeros, the, the red ones are ones. Um, and then you can export this as ASCII art or as a ROM image. Um, there's been prior work in this area, like Adam Laurie, who's around here somewhere, he wrote a tool called ROMPAR, uh, which was the earliest public example of this. Uh, Chris Gerlinski has a, a tool that does it, but this is uh, modern and it is fast. And it lets you do things like infinite zoom and design rule checks. So if you screw up in annotating this, it will tell you where you screwed up and allow you to correct just that. Uh, it also runs on the command line, so you can do regression tests on your annotations. So if you're working on a very big project, you can um, you know, script it in order to make sure that you catch any mistakes. Um, so that's what I'm working on. But a keynote is not supposed to be about uh, your technical projects. It's supposed to be about like life and society and all the high flu shit. So I would like to invite you to, to meet my buddy Gordon. Um, last week was Gordon's birthday. Uh, if you could just say happy birthday to Gordon for the camera. Cool. Um, I met Gordon during the, uh, the lockdowns in 2020. Um, he joined my pub quiz team. Uh, and I don't mean a Zoom pub quiz. I live in, uh, in East Tennessee and things work a little different there. Um, every Tuesday night, we'd all hang out. We'd uh, answer some questions. He'd join our table. And Gordon is the happiest man that I know. Um, we've checked. It's not because of a brain injury or anything like that. Uh, and it's not that he's naturally happy. The guy used to be a grumpy asshole. Um, no one who knows him now believes that, but it is true. Um, we call him Weatherman because every time you see him, uh, he'll, he'll talk about the weather, and even if it's shit, he will talk about the nicest part about it. He'll be like, yeah, you know, it, it, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and all the civilization was flooded, and we had to get on that, that boat, and uh, the, the animal shit was everywhere, but at the end of it, man, like, what a sunset. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I've already mentioned that I, like, drive old cars and stuff. Um, this is my uh, 1960s Studebaker Champ. And this is Gordo with helping me out with a bicycle pump. We had to set up a chain gang to pump up the rear tire when it was too flat for us to get it to a pump, and we didn't have an electric one around. A um, few people know this, but Gordon used to be a nuclear engineer. Um, he did an entire career of this. He sent two children uh, through college this. Um... He, he trained himself for it, you know. Um, and every day as a nuclear engineer, he would go to an office building and he would sit there and he'd, um, yeah, he wasn't lucky enough to sit by the window. You gotta, you gotta be pretty high ranking for that. And he, he'd just sit there and he was bored out of his mind. He got sick of staring at these spreadsheets. He got sick of, of having all of these meetings. The only thing he really enjoyed was field work. Um, every now and then he'd get it to go out to a construction site and see where they were building stuff. Um, uh, again, for those of you who are too young, the United States of America used to build nuclear reactors. Um, so after his kids were in college and after they were able to support themselves and stuff, he said to hell with it and he quit to do landscaping. And now every day he goes out into the sunshine and, um, he works on a yard. And by the end of the day, that yard looks better than when it started. And he comes to the bar with a smile on his face. And he hangs out with a nice dog. And uh, he's happy. And the shame of it all is that if he were a reverse engineer instead of a nuclear engineer, I think that he could have continued his profession while still being that happy. Because as a nuclear engineer, um, 
It, well, it's kind of like reverse engineering in that if you do nuclear engineering in your garage, you also get to go to The Hague. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the accommodations might not be as comfortable. But, <laughs> um, but he, can't, he can't practice his craft independently. And he can't work on a, a small problem because there are no small problems in nuclear engineering. There are small pieces of big problems. But making sure that, you know, pipe number 97 uh, has an appropriate thermal expansion ratio, uh, it becomes unfulfilling after a while. And he's not able to have the same variety that we can have in reverse engineering. He's not able to switch over to a new project when the old one gets boring or when the old one is finished. Um, back when I was a grump, uh, I made the dumbass decision to move to New York City once. Twice. We're talking about the second time? I should have learned my lesson the first time. Um, when I first started there, it was a ton of fun. I got to do reverse engineering. I was, I got to, um, uh, to take apart an entire product line and learn absolutely everything about it. I got to show up on a factory floor and, uh, take apart everything on that factory floor so that I could recreate that factory elsewhere. Um, I learned some things that have still scarred me. Uh, I know dialects of fourth in which integers are verbs. Um, I got to reverse engineer the um, password authentication mechanism for uh, soldering oven. And the password was oven. Um, I was told it was lowercase or maybe the first letter was capitalized. It turns out that the actual password, uh, O, V, and N, had to be uppercase. But the E could be uppercase or lowercase. Because the hashing algorithm, which was ripped off of planetsourcecode.com, um, had this thing where it would like hash the stuff and then mask off the most significant bit so that it wouldn't be beyond the ASCII range. And then if it were in the bottom 32 bytes, it would add 32 to the value. And 32 is also the distance between uppercase and lowercase numbers, and that's why it collided. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was a little wasteful to use an IDA Pro license just to figure out um, <laughs> why this worked, but it was a ton of fun. Um, and another great thing about that was that uh, I got to meet this fellow, Jeff Chappell. Um, Jeff is an old school Windows reverse engineer. And at the time, I knew nothing about Windows, but I had to learn it quickly. Um, random Windows fact. Um, I had this, um, executable called, uh, fwupdate.exe. And it required administrative privileges. And I spent, I spent so much time trying to reverse engineer why. Like, which flag in my linking script is making this thing require administrative privileges when the exact same code in a different compiling target ran fine as an unprivileged user. And the reason why is that in Windows, anything that in includes update in the executable name has to run as administrator. <laughs> there was no single bit inside of it. I also learned that, um, you know, coming from a Unix background, this is absolutely insane. Um, in Windows, you have different types of executables for graphical and console applications. So there is no way to have a command line tool whereby providing a flag, it might, uh, you know, run as a headless GUI or by another flag, but then run command line only. You have to do separate executables for that because there's a one bit difference in the FDE header. Um, now Jeff was really, really old school. Um, he still has no cell phone. Uh, if I want to reach him, I call his apartment, and if he does not answer at his apartment, I can try uh, the office of his main consulting client, or I can, if, if, the, if it's dinner time, I call his neighborhood bar, and uh, when they pick up, I just say, hey, uh, could you pass this to the dapper Australian fellow by the bar with the fancy hat? They'll say, oh, Jeff, sure, here you go, Jeff. <laughs> And they actually hand him the cordless phone of the bar like uh, we were in the 1980s or something. He does his reverse engineering in text files. Um, he'll take his disassembler, he'll disassemble the 
file into a text file, and then he uses find and replace to update the symbol names, and he adds his own comments to the side of it. And when you get the results of his reverse engineering, it is a perfectly commented disassembly. Or, if he has more time, he'll rewrite it in C, and the C won't compile to be byte perfect, because he's not that particular, but it's pretty close. Um, if you know of Jeff, you probably know of him through his website, jefftrapple.com, at which he documents his, um, uh, his reverse engineering. Um, while I was working with him, I trolled him into... Uh, I, I kept teasing him about different Windows things. Like, um, in... Yeah, this was in the Windows 7 era. Now, in Unix, uh, and in Windows 7, if I have my command line here, and I want it to be taller, well, I just drag it, and it becomes taller, and I get more rows. And in Unix, if I want it to be wider, I just drag it wider. But in, in Windows 7, if you want it to be wider, you need to right-click on the background, go into Properties, go into the third pane, and then type in the number of columns you want, then click Apply, then click OK. So I trolled him into patching conhost.dll so that I could drag the command line wider on Windows 7. And then I kept bragging about it every time I ran into a Microsoft employee. And Windows 10 now supports dragging the command line wider. <laughs> So don't let anyone tell you that trolling isn't useful. Um, this is another piece of history. Um, uh, for the kids in the audience, um, there used to be this thing called AOL Instant Messenger, and it used to matter socially. Um, and when you come up with a new chat network, you have this problem that no one will use it because all of their friends are on the old network. So Microsoft came out with MSN Messenger, which is the one on the left, and they had this great idea. Why not just have the client connect to AOL servers as well as Microsoft servers so that you can chat to people from either network? So when you connect to MSN Messenger, it does not just connect to the Microsoft server. It also connects to the AOL server. And AOL was a little pissed because this was a threat to their business line. Uh, never mind that they never made any money off of Instant Messenger. It's the principle that counts. So... There are a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, one way is you can be very particular about how your protocol is implemented. And you can recognize uh, what's called a parser differential in LangSec, which, is, which basically means that if two interpreters are written for the same language, unless you put a lot of care into it, there will be differences between them. And, if you, and you can exploit that difference in order to remain compatible with one while being incompatible with another. Or perhaps even making a message that means one thing to one parser and a different thing to another parser. Um, and this is useful for real-world exploits. Uh, for example, UTF-8 allows you to have foreign languages in strings without having to configure every website and every database server uniquely for that language. It is a big deal that we live in an era in which I can have the Turkish I without the dot in the same file as the Hungarian O with the two acute accents. Uh, and there was a time when that couldn't happen. But as we standardized on that, uh, there are still differences between implementations of UTF-8. Uh, for example, you can express the you can express a single letter as what's called an orphaned pair, which is where you have um, you have it decode to two you, to two 16-bit UTF values that then form a single character. And most interpreters do not allow this, but some of them do. Um, in any case, uh, LangSec did not exist in the 90s, and no one knew that parser differentials were a good way to do this. So what's another way to do this? Well, AOL had gotten this bug report. They were vulnerable to a stack buffer overflow in AOL's domestic. If you were the server, the protocol name is Oscar, you were the Oscar server, you could send a message that would overflow the call stack in the client. And this is a 32-bit Windows application without any mitigations at all, because this was 1997. So AOL, getting this bug report, they realized, you know, we could fix this bug, or 
We could send a memory corruption exploit down to our own clients because they will be vulnerable while the MSN Messenger clients will not be, and that way we can do a survey in order to know how many of our users are really running a well instant messenger and how many are running our competitor. Jeff was the one who reverse engineered this and explained it to the world. Um, he also reverse engineered Windows 3.1. Um, the beta version of Windows 3.1 was not compatible with uh, DR DOS. And that in itself is not a problem. Like many pieces of software are not compatible with each other. But Jeff reverse engineered it and he showed that the reason why it was not compatible was that it was intentionally incompatible. They had written a check in order to identify which DOS they were running on, and specifically broken compatibility with DR DOS in order to push people back to Microsoft DOS. Um, while I worked with him in New York, uh, I had a blast. I learned so many different things, um, and at, at that time I was pretty happy with him. He was not happy. Because in his mind, he was an author, and he was a reverse engineer, and what he wanted to do was to make his life's work understanding the internals of Windows. That's what he cared about. And prior to taking that job, he had been publishing rather regularly on it. Like Every month, he would publish up some notes, different notes each month, different topics, whatever he was working on. For the five years in which he worked at that company, he, there were three months in which he published anything at all. And this really bummed him out. So for the final two years that I was working with him, every single day he would announce his very last day at the company. Every single day he'd say, you know, um, and this was in like 2014, he'd say, you know, January 2016 is coming up and I'm out of here, guys. Five year anniversary, I'm gone. And then January 2016 comes up, and uh, he turns in his two weeks' notice, and his manager is like, what the hell, Jeff? We need you here. He's like, I've been telling you for two years. Um, his, his biggest gripe was not his publication. His biggest gripe is that he couldn't find enough time of peace and quiet in which to do his work. So I uh, think reverse engineering requires that people not bother you. And if you're not the sort of person who can crank up music really loud on headphones and ignore the movement around you, um, it has an impact. And even if you are that sort of person, you know, whether you can keep a 32-bit pointer in your head or you've got to kind of do like 16 bits at a time, that, that makes a difference. How often your cache gets flushed and you have to context switch. How often the asshole sitting next to you has a loud phone call and keeps droning on uh, as you're unable to crank your volume loud enough to ignore it. That has an impact. Um, if you're ever stuck in a large corporation and you need to find peace and quiet, one trick that you can do is there's often a database of the seating arrangement, and you can query this database. So you can write like a little shell script or a web service that will tell you which floor of the building has the most empty desks, and that will be the floor that people are uh, reorganizing away from. And then you can go there, and for about a week, all of the desks will be empty. You just pick one, set up with your laptop, and have a piece of quiet on the entire floor to yourself. Um, in any case, uh, Jeff works from a desktop, not from a laptop. I mean, he wasn't able to make things like that work. So um, after providing his two years' notice and then his two weeks' notice, he leaves. And um, this is his publication record for 2016. Um, this is an 11-month streak. And it continues into 2017. And he had an absolute blast. Um, he now does consulting. Uh, so he's able to work roughly half-time and sort of balance his work between interesting client projects and interesting uh, personal projects for his website. Um, if you need a Windows consultant, hire him because he is very good. Uh, and he will only take your job if it's interesting, which, uh, <laughs> which I like. Um, and I, I really liked that job while I was working with Jeff. Um, but then uh, I finished my big reverse engineering project successfully. I delivered it, and uh, I saved the day, and everything went, went great on that front. Um, so I got punished with another project. And um, I, this was also the time that uh, there was a big push toward Agile. And... Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I should have given a trigger warning before showing the slide. Um, 
If you're covering your eyes now, you'll want to keep them covered for the next slide. I'll let you know when it's safe to look again. Um, so, like, this kind of makes sense if you've got, like, a sweatshop of Java programmers working together on the same code base. Um, this is a lot less effective if you if your software is organized in different ways, if your pieces are further apart from each other. Um, there is no reason why the uh, engineer working on the battery lifetime of an embedded system needs to hear about the um, color of the font in the Windows GUI of the same product. Uh, these people can happily not be in the same meeting. And I got stuck in one of these things every morning. You see on the right where it says daily scrum, 15 minutes? Where it says 15 minutes, it means 90 minutes. This was every morning of my life for many months from 9.30 until 11 o'clock. And suffering through this for an hour and a half each morning, at 11 o'clock, how much gumption do you have do you imagine any of us had to get a damn thing done? Enough to get anything done before lunch? Absolutely not. So you got a coffee break after. Um, I, I I don't smoke, but I'd, I'd go out for a smoke break too. Um, and then um, then it's lunchtime, and then after lunch you need another coffee. Um, this one meeting basically killed the productivity of maybe 15 senior engineers for every morning, every day of the week. Um, and what we would do in the meeting, because uh, in theory you're supposed to do stand-up. So uh, I was asked to stand up, and I get up, and I'm like, okay. So there's a talent agent, and uh, this family goes into the talent agent. It's a mother, a father, a grand... <laughs> um, I'm not going to finish that joke here. But uh, <laughs> what we did instead was we updated uh, a Kanban board in Jira. And we spent an hour and a half watching these boxes move around. And um, it it was miserable. So during that, um, I, I had this uh, uh, the, the middle school that I went to. Um, we had separate literature and composition classes. And my literature teacher, Mrs. Pittman, um, she taught us that if we were bored in a classroom, we could do whatever the fuck we wanted as long as it was quiet and didn't bother anyone else. Uh, her suggestion was that we read. And that worked out well, but I didn't have any novels with me. Um, what I did have was my wristwatch. So I took it apart during the meeting, and I put it back together, and I took it apart and put it back together. and I, uh, I, I, <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty miserable. So uh, I, I quit, too, just like Jeff did. I put in my two weeks' notice. I handed off all of my files. Um, when you're hired to reverse engineer something, um, you very often see the very worst documentation in a company. And I was very careful not to leave the same thing behind. Like, I got all my notes in order. I got all my files. Um, you know, I had a hard disk that I labeled. Like, Travis's shit, do not throw away. Uh, I handed all of that out, and I went to Human Resources to do, like, my exit interview. Uh, exit interviews are wild, because... Um, uh, you basically like work half of that day and then you get called up to the HR floor and you go in and you sit down and you have this meeting and they're like, why are you leaving? And I'm like, because it sucks. <laughs> um, after the back and forth, though, um, they ask you if you have any final questions, uh, which is oddly like a job interview itself, right? So um, I said, yeah. Um, I heard this story that some guy lost his shit a few years ago and went swimming in the koi pond on the sixth floor. And I heard that he still works here. Is that true? <laughs> she was expecting me to ask about, like, the health insurance or something like that. So she takes a moment, still, still composed. You know, I'm sure uh, people have said weirder stuff. And she looks me right in the eye and she says... Are you thinking about that right now? <laughs> so let's be honest. I'm not going to do it, but we're both thinking about it. <laughs> um, and then after after your exit interview, right after you hand over like your credit card and your badge and um, all of that stuff, uh, you just sort of walk out of the building, and then you have zero responsibilities. I mean, except for like uh, rent and taxes and that sort of shit. Um, 
And I was expecting to regret this decision or maybe have some second thoughts and maybe worry about the shitload of money that I was losing by quitting before bonus season. And I didn't. Um, instead, what I did was I, I went back to that watch. And um, if you look at this, um, there are these uh, zebra stripes along the, um, along the PCB, one for the LCD and one for the keypad. And um, there's like a little zebra connector that goes between those. So if you make another circuit board in the same size and shape with the same connectors, you can reuse the plastics and the mechanical manufacturing of the device. Um, and the irony is not lost on me that um, you know I quit a job making a battery-powered embedded system with an LCD because I didn't believe that it would ship, and then I immediately went to the bar and designed a different one. Um, so I, I sat down and I measured all of the different connectors. Um, there are some tricks to this, like um, if you try to use your micrometer to measure the distance between any two pins, when they get this small, you'll have a lot of error. So instead, you just count them and you measure the distance between the furthest pins, and in that way you can get a more accurate connection. Um, there's also the problem that the watch chip has an LCD controller that is designed just for that LCD, whereas your substitute chip will need to be something that you can order in small quantities and therefore can't be custom. Um, so you can use little sticky notes in order to cover individual pins of the LCD connector to sort of mock up which cells would be drawn on the old watch as you're designing the new watch before your prototype arrives. Um, here on the left is my first functional prototype. On the right is the manufacturer's original. Um, you can critique a couple of things about this. Like, I don't have the curved edges yet. Um, my early firmware had uh, atrocious battery life. Uh, but this worked. Um, here are the same things in X-Ray. Um, the It is so cool to just be able to set these in the X-Ray and photograph it now. Like, um, I love being an adult. Um, this is the chip that I used. It's the Chipcon 430 uh, F6147. Um, the same firmware where also works in the 6137 in case like uh, global supply lines get screwed over and suddenly we have to salvage parts from the dump. Um, the cool thing about this chip, if you look at the bottom, you can see those little lollipop inductor structures. Um, this chip not only has an MSP430 microcontroller and uh, voltage regulators and the um, LCD controller built in, it also has a built-in sub gigahertz radio, so you can receive and transmit in this chip. I solder it all together, I get the thing functioning. Um, the one on the left is connected to uh, a UART built out of an old GoodFet running into a laptop. Um, I can recognize this by the counter. This is a beer bar in Manhattan. Um, and every day I would go to um, uh, this coffee house, Drop a Girl on East 66th Street, and I'd sit down and I would just write the firmware for this, and about four o'clock I was finished, and I felt so damn good. Um, I mean, I still lived in a shithole of a city. Uh, there were still rats everywhere, but aside from the rats, I had it pretty good back then. Um, I built later prototypes with the, uh, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the right way to do an antenna. Um, if you meet me later on, you'll see the, in the one that I'm wearing, I've got um, like a coiled antenna by the side, and the, the ground plane is in the wrong position, but I'm getting closer. The trouble with this design is that the, um, the antenna flexes, and anything that flexes that much while bending the copper back and forth will snap. So this particular antenna will only last for a month or two of wear before it falls apart. Um, I added applications to it. So this app is the uh, hex editor showing the uh, real-time clock control register at 016E. You'll see that the one on the left, the silver watch, has a value of 0400, and the one on the right has a value of 0402. Uh, I took this at a conference in Budapest, not having the equipment to connect a debugger to the watches, but I brought two with me, and one of them was keeping perfect time, and one of them was running fast. The one that was running fast had the two-bit set, and from the data sheet in the background on the laptop, I was able to figure out that this was an error flag that I was not handling, and I was able to adjust the code to compensate. 
Um, in case I'm ever stuck in another hour and a half long Scrum meeting, there's also a disassembler built in. So I can disassemble the firmware of the watch from the screen of the watch. Um, there's a carry wave transmitter. So again, if I'm stuck in that same um, Scrum meeting, I can send an SOS call by 70 centimeters. Uh, local ham radio operators are listening. They can show up in mobility scooters and help me out. Um, it's also got a frequency counter, and this is really handy. Like, um, the power of doing a carry wave transmission, it's like cool as a demo or a joke or something, but being able to count the frequency of a transmitter from my wrist without having any extra equipment is really handy. Uh, it means that if I'm at an event, I can just hang out next to the security guard, wait for him to transmit, and then know what the channel is for the uh, security radius of the conference. Um, You'll see that it's off by a little bit. I'm, I'm doing this technique where, um, because like, it's not a software-defined radio. I can't do uh, a fast Fourier transform and then just pick a peak. Instead, what I have to do is I have to slide with a narrow filter through the different frequencies and then look to see which one has the highest received signal strength. Um, I also built a pager receiver for Poxac, so you can send a page from your cell phone through an amateur radio tower to the watch and then see the um, page on the watch. Uh, I added remote control for um, these cheap little relays that you can buy on, uh, online. Um, and then um, a firefighter in um, Nevada, uh, WU7ANG, he sent me uh, a pull request that adds uh, the transmitter I use the most. Um, you'll see these jukeboxes all around the states in really trashy bars and in Waffle Houses. Um, if you've not had a Waffle House, uh, when you next visit America, please go. It's an experience. They're open 24 hours a day, including during hurricanes. Um, I'm not joking. Our, uh, in the same way that uh, there's like the Richter scale and the F scale for natural disasters, there's the Waffle House Index. Um, if more than two Waffle Houses are closed in the state, then um, like there's probably a military invasion or a very serious national natural disaster. Um, these things can run without electricity. Uh, like they have their own gas reserves. Um, and they have these jukeboxes. But when you have a jukebox, in, whether it's in a bar or in a Waffle House, people disagree about the music. For example, my buddy Torsten uh, went to one of these in Needles, California, and he loaded that Bananarama hair commercial song, uh, I'm Your Venus, I'm Your Fire thing, um, 16 times, followed by Neuden Neuze Luftballon, um, in the original German, which he was singing along in syllable by syllable, uh, just to remind the entire bar which asshole played the hair commercial song all the time. To work around this, the bartender has a remote control that can turn the jukebox off or skip a paid song, and the watch now has that same uh, ability. Um, in any case, um, when things are not going well, when you find that you've had five years without publication, when you find that you're not enjoying your work, uh, you can fix that. And you can fix that either inside of the company or outside of the company. You can fix that by um, blowing a ton of money on a home x-ray machine and some chemistry equipment, or you can fix it by buying a, a $30 development kit and tinkering around it into the local coffee house the weekend. But do fix it and do not allow yourself to fall out of reverse engineering in the same way that my buddy Gordon, as happy as he is, fell out of nuclear engineering. Um, because reverse engineering is a shitload of fun, and it feels good, and you're in it for a reason, uh, so don't fall out of it. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, enjoy the sunset, have some fun, and share reverse engineering with each other. Thank you. Thanks, Travis for a really inspirational speech and uh, now tell me that all those people who use iPads for programming are weird. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience?
uh, an older guy myself. Um, are uh, were you inspired anyway by the psycho watches that already had like the radio things in them? Um, no, actually, I was inspired by the TI Chronos watch, ah. which was a development kit. Yeah, maybe like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. The trouble with the Chronos watch was that it was horrifically uncomfortable to wear, and um, TI used to have a developers conference each year, which was absolutely amazing. It was like nine parallel tracks that were just telling you how to build shit. And the only part about it that was corporate propaganda was that they coincidentally used Texas Instruments parts. And uh, at that conference, I met some guys from um, MetaWatch, which was a startup that forked out of Fossil. And they were explaining to me that it doesn't matter how cool the Kronos watch is from the development angle. That... Um, they expected it to fail because it was uncomfortable to wear. And that if the uh, if you're making a wearable, it first has to be comfortable and then it has to look cool. And if you don't get those two things right, it will sit in a drawer and no one will wear it and it will not be a product. And so looking at the uh, Casio watch, which is a successful watch, which is comfortable to wear, it's cool in at least some areas, uh, <laughs> I realized that if I could fit that same chip into that package, that I would be able to get the comfort and the style from Casio for free, um, and then also have the electronics advantage of being able to run my own code. And do the IMME as well? Um, the IMME, the Girl Tech IMME was a children's toy, for those of you who don't know, which uses the same radio as this watch. And, um, it is not very stylish, and it is not very comfortable <laughs> to carry, but it is so cool and so connected. Uh, and by the way, that firefighter, I recognize the call sign. He's a really awesome dude. He is, yes. Thanks. Any other questions? No questions. So, give it another round of applause, please. To Travis Goodspeed.